Mises in 1919. 1919 was a catastrophic year, not only for Austria, but for many countries in Europe, but for Austria in particular. Austria had just been through four years of a devastating war. And then at the end of this war, in uh, October 1918, and uh, November 1918, uh, most uh, uh, provinces of the country seceded for various reasons that we do not need to consider tonight. Um, but the result was that uh, what we today call Austria, the little uh, country essentially spread out on the eastern part of the Alps, was uh, suddenly all that was left of the former Austria-Hungary. And the Austrians, uh, at the time, did not perceive themselves as, as Austrians, because Austria was commonly or traditionally the name that referred to the uh, territorial possessions of the Habsburg family in the eastern part of the former Roman uh, Empire, uh, German Empire of the uh, uh, Holy uh, Roman uh, Empire of the German nation. So Austria, the Eastern Empire. Now, so they, they called their country German Austria, Deutsch Österreich, uh, which already expressed a, a lack of identity. And uh, this country was so suddenly left by all former provinces, the provinces from, from which before they received foodstuff uh, and various raw materials. Now the new governments of the seceding countries uh, had no more ur urgent business than to impose restrictions on foreign trade. Okay, so for various reasons, that some of which uh, Professor Murphy discussed this afternoon. Uh, so they had been fallen prey to various errors, but uh, it was not only uh, erroneous, but they especially they were uh, often inspired by uh, feelings of revenge and uh, resentment against uh, uh, the Austrians, and so uh, blocked exports to what is today Austria. The result was, of course, a catastrophic year of 1919, the winter of 1918-19 brought uh, deprivation, uh, famines in, uh, in Austria. Um, and it brought, of course, uh, the uh, rise of socialist regimes in all of Central Europe. Okay, the communists had won power in Russia in 1917. And now at the end of World War I, socialist governments came to power in almost all countries of Central Europe. So the socialists ruled democratically in Germany and in Austria, and they ruled dictatorially in Hungary and Bavaria. This was the situation in 1919. In Austria, the democratically ruling socialists established a commission for the socialization of the economy, or more precisely for the nationalization of the economy. Uh, its, most, uh, its foremost uh, activist, uh, the party leader Otto Bauer, published a book with the title The Road to Socialism in early 1919. So we can imagine that uh, Friedrich von Hayek reacted uh, some 25 years later when he wrote The Road to Serfdom. The Road to so Socialism is not a nice road, it's a road to serfdom. And uh, socialism went uh, in hand with uh, inflation, with huge unemployment in Austria, and with the rebellion of the provinces, so social disintegration. This was the context in which Mises uh, wrote, thought, uh, spoke, and, and acted. And what we'll deal with uh, today is therefore, uh, well, what, what precisely he did, and uh, what I'll try to show to you is that Mises, in many ways, was, a, well, as usual, a role model, a very inspiring uh, man uh, who, by whatever he did, uh, yeah, was truly uh, a model. So we'll first go through his analysis of the situation as it prevailed in 1919. How did we come to this mess? Uh, what, are the, uh, what are the causes? What were the consequences? And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the actions, uh, what, what Mises actually did apart from analyzing the situation. The analysis that Mises proposed of uh, the mess in which Austria found itself in 1919 can be essentially derived from his book, Nation, State, and Economy, that was published well, in German in that year, 1919, in the summer of 1919, and which was translated and published in 1983 at, with a translation from Professor Leland Jäger uh, by New York University, and which was uh, just this year republished by Liberty Fund. Uh, the book had the working title, Imperialism. Okay? Mm 
So it's a nice connection with our conference uh, this weekend. And, um, well, there's a reason why Mises eventually changed the title. Now we'll come to talk about this. But uh, what is important, of course, is that he, well, how does he define imperialism? He doesn't give a, an explicit definition, but it is clear that he means by it the opposite of liberty. Okay? It's the suppression or the coercion of uh, foreign political groups that are weaker than our national government. Uh, so it's a co co coercion of weaker groups by stronger groups, and in particular in the case of uh, weaker foreign groups. Uh, so this offers me a nice uh, opportunity to thank uh, Professor Reiko for his great service in uh, uh, clarifying the meaning of the Statue of Liberty in New York. And, uh, Madame Liberty holds, in fact, a torch. Uh, it's not a flamethrower. <laughs> <laughs> and unfortunately, it's, it's necessary to, to stress this again today because uh, I, uh, I wonder how many Iraqis and uh, uh, other Af Afghans or other nationals would have this spontaneously this interpretation. Okay, so what does Mises do in his book? Well, he has uh, the book has three chapters. In the first one, he offers a very original analysis of uh, the rise, uh, development, mm -hmm. origin, development, and, and decline of nations, right, with the help of well, what economists call methodological individualism. And he analyzes the impact of government interventionism on the flourishment of nations, and he shows, well, it has not a positive impact. The second chapter deals with war socialism, and in particular, uh, so the theoretical analysis of what had been going on from 1914 to 1918. And in the third chapter, he deals with the history and the politics of the social democratic parties, in particular in Austria, but also in Germany. Mises analyzes uh, the situation under, uh, under five titles, we would say. First of all, he explains that imperialism is a reaction to classical liberalism. Then he goes on to stress the first casualty of imperialism. Then he stresses that uh, there is an interdependence, in fact, between foreign government interventionism, so imperialism, and domestic coercion. Uh, fourth, he uh, goes on to highlight the intricate relationship that exists between imperialism and inflation. And finally, he offers some practical conclusions for um, public policy, how to deal with this uh, situation. Okay, so first, and that is uh, his most important point, he stresses that imperialism was a reaction to classical liberalism. The classical liberal program can be summarized under two headings. First of all, reduction of all obstructions to private property, abolition of all restraints on private property. The second point is uh, self-determination for all national groups. Now, um, uh, in practice, this meant then, or the classical liberals meant by this, uh, the establishment of, of a democratic regime. And the question was then, how do we define a nation? What is the nation that should dis uh, decide about its own fate in the way of, uh, or by democratic means? And commonly, nation was defined as a language community. This was least uh, problematic in the case of the Western nations, such as France and, and England, or also the United States, which shared a common language. It was somewhat problematic in the case of the, the states of Central Europe and, and Eastern Europe, which uh, harbored different language communities. So um, what Mises then pointed out uh, is that in this case, because we had mixed populations, mixed nations, in fact, in Central and Eastern Europe, um, the application of the classical liberal program led to very different results than it led in the, in the West. Because we had mixed populations, it now meant that uh, the program of uh, democracy meant that the ma ma uh, majority nation, so the, the co-nationals of which were in the numerical nu uh, majority, could rule over the numerically inferior other nations, other language communities. Now, in the case of uh, Germany and Austria, th this led to the following conflict of interest for uh, the ruling uh, nations, which were the Germans, so German language communities. Uh, they had in the entire state they had uh, the power in their hands, 
But if they were now to set out to apply the classical liberal program of self-determination on a local level, that would have implied that uh, their co-nationals in the, in the East would have lost the power of self-determination. So they would have come under the rule of, of other nations. Uh, so here we have then a particular situation that did not exist in the, in the West. And as a consequence of this conflict, Mises explained, the Germans and the Austrians turned imperialist. And so faced with the choice of either abandoning their, their co-nationals to the rule of, of other nations or ruling centrally over these other nations, well, they, they preferred the latter alternative. Um, but he also points out in, the, in this book, Nation, State, and Economy, that the same was later applied also on an international level after uh, well, the, the Western Allies won World War I. Uh, they created the Treaty of uh, uh, the League of Versailles, and they imposed certain peace conditions on Austria and Germany in the treaties of Versailles and of Saint-Germain, uh, in the case of Austria, Saint-Germain. And uh, here is how Mises int interpreted this. He said, well, clearly um, uh, the, the principle of national, national self-determination is no longer admitted. It is squarely contradicted by the conditions of these uh, peace treaties. So I quote him here from, from the book. He says, the chief point remains that nations are being punished and that the four-feature theory comes to life again. If one admits exceptions to the right of self-determination of nations, to the disadvantage of evil nations, as today we would say rogue nations, one has overturned the first principle of the free community of nations. Okay. So Mises' analysis seems to apply to the particular case, or he formulated it in the light on, uh, uh, with consideration to the special case of language communities, but there are, of course, more general lessons that we can derive from his analysis. Right. What he stresses is the relationship between the greater mobility that has been created by the classical liberal program. Right. If you abolish restraints of, uh, on private property rights, well, you will allow people to move from one place to another freely, uh, and you will also allow well, to move up the social ladder. So whenever this mobility sets in, spatial mobility and social mobility, local power balances invariably shift. Okay, that's a necessary consequence. And here we have then the problem. problem. Formerly domin dominant political constituencies then can become minorities. And the problem emerges again and again. How do we react face to this situation? Uh, do we now start to, to coerce the majority, keep them under our thumb? Uh, or do we permit the transition of power to the new groups? Uh, a second point that can be generalized from Mises' analysis is that national frontiers are secondary. Right? So the imperialist relation between strong politically stronger groups and politically weaker groups can obtain even within a nation state, even within the political frontiers of a nation. Then Mises goes on to point out, secondly, what is the first uh, casualty of imperialism? Well, it's that the commitment to liberty declines. Okay. And here again, I can refer to what Professor Reiko uh, said uh, an hour ago about William Graham Sumner and his essay on the conquest of the United States by Spain, which also ex explain, uh, applies in this case. Right? And Mises, again, without quoting Sumner, whom he probably hadn't read at the time, comes essentially to share the same point. I quote him. He says, to fight imperialism, the peaceful must employ all its means. If they then triumph in the struggle, they may indeed have crushed their opponent. Yet they, they themselves have been conquered by his methods and his way of thinking. They then do, no lay, do not lay down their weapons again. They themselves remain imperialists. And the application was, of course, that he had in mind was the League of Nations. Right? The Western Allies had prevailed in the military conflict over the Central Powers, but the, conquer, the, but the, the spirit of the Central Powers had conquered these Western nations. And the, the concrete proof of this, the, the manifestation, was well, the, the peace uh, dictates of Versailles and Saint-Germain. Uh, Mises was uh, directly concerned by this. He was, in fact, uh, at the time, 
uh, a consultant of the trade department in the Austrian foreign ministry. So he was uh, concerned with elaborating, uh, working out those questions that concern to, to trade issues in the uh, peace negotiations. The third point that Mises stresses is the interdependence between foreign and domestic coercion. War is uh, the attempt to uh, overthrow of a foreign power served as a pretext for domestic coercion as well. And the result was in the Great War what was called war socialism. Uh, at the beginning, war socialism um, was not, uh, well, f during the first two years it did not exist, but starting in 1916, early 1916, the government, who had uh, uh, financed part of its um, activities with the printing press, now tried to avoid the inevitable consequence of using inflation for war finance, namely rising prices, and so it established a, a regime of price controls. And as we know from the economic analysis of price controls, once you start with controlling one price, you cannot stop there. Okay, you need to go on. Uh, because if you control just one price, then, well, you create trouble for those companies who have to sell at this price. Some of these companies will become unprofitable, so they need to go out of business. And so there's now the temptation for the government to repair his first, its first uh, intervention by in establishing a price control also on the buying prices of, the, of these companies and so on. And that was exactly how things went on during the f First World War. And after uh, a few months, virtually the entire economy was uh, covered by a system of price controls and it now became necessary to establish some mechanism for the central direction of uh, the economic process. That is for the central, the central centrally direct, directed decision-making process that allocates the different resources, workers, raw materials, and so on, to the different branches of industry. And again, that was exactly what, what happened. And this new uh, centralized um, uh, economic dictatorship was uh, concentrated on the German side. So the Germans under General Ludendorff in particular organized war socialism for both Germany and Austria. Now, as Mises points out, uh, again, the, uh, the justification of this is the war. Right? We need to fight the foreign enemy. As a consequence, we now really we can no longer leave business to, to private entrepreneurs. We now must become finally serious because right before we could let, them, let the entrepreneurs play a little bit market and so on, but now we have no more time for these games. We need to we create an efficient economic regime. So we need to create war socialism. Right? And uh, Mises then showed that this whole uh, analysis was fallacious. Right? The war was a false pretext for creating coercion at home, for creating a socialism at home. The crucial question is, is a socialistic uh, uh, economic regime more likely to serve the ends of the war that is overthrowing the enemy than a free market. And here Mises answers, well, that, that is not the case. Even if you have a war abroad, and if you have so the application of violence to, to wrestle down an enemy, precisely then you need to have an economy that adjusts as flexibly and therefore also as, as quickly as possible to the changing conditions uh, as they evolve during the war. And the, the only economic system that can do this Oh, well, the economic system that can do this in the, in the, in the most flexible and, uh, and quick way is the market economy. So precisely in a war, uh, precisely when, when you are in a, in a great emergency situation, you cannot let the government hamper production. Uh, precisely then you need to free the market, need to have a free market economy. <laughs> so Mises created uh, what we might call um, the discipline of war economics, okay, with a completely free market approach, which inspired, in the interwar uh, period, uh, many young economists, such as Lionel Robbins in, in England, and also in Germany, a few authors, the names of whom do not tell you anything, but for example, Georg Holzbauer and others. Uh, uh, Stefan Possoni, who later em emigrated to the uh, United States, and which therefore so rethought uh, uh, the, the economics of war on a completely different uh, line. Fourth, uh, 
Mises analyzed the intricate relationship between war and inflation. The fundamental point is, well, war does not pay. Or we might uh, say in more general terms, coercion does not pay. Right? And okay, that's an, yeah, I admit this is an a priori statement, but it is a true a priori statement. <laughs> okay? right? the, the simple fact is, if it did pay, it would not be necessary to, to coerce people. It's very simple. If it does pay, why not go on and just make contracts? Why force people if your activity is profitable? Right? So the, the fact that you have to resort to violence is always a proof that your activity, whatever its justification, is certainly not profitable. Okay? So how do you finance an activity that is not profitable? Well, uh, government can resort to taxation. If the governments of Europe during the Great War had resorted exclusively to taxation, the war would have ended pretty soon. Okay? Would have ended in 1916 at latest. Uh, because if people really have to pay out of their own pockets all the expenses of the government, they're pretty quickly fed up <laughs> with, with this whole enterprise. Right? And so what governments did then was to have recourse to public debt, uh, which already extends the, the margin of operation, and they had uh, recourse to the printing press, uh, that is to, to inflation. So governments, in order to finance their expenditure, had the central bank print additional banknotes which it then used, which they then used to pay for their expenses. And after the war, this policy was then continued by the socialists. Right? They too pursued a policy, while well, it was not tapping on other people's head, but it was a, a social policy, what they called social policy, which was not profitable by definition. It's not profitable to pay handouts to unemployed people. It's not profitable to buy uh, agricultural products at higher than world market prices from uh, uh, farmers and to sell them at lower than world market prices to the urban population. Okay? But that's precisely what the Austrian government did. And it announced this as a great progress. Right? A social policy, and so unemployment relief, uh, food policy prices, uh, it, it meant imposing maximum work hours, so at a time when the Austrian economy had precisely uh, would have needed as much work as possible to adjust to the new conditions, right, to the new uh, peace conditions, uh, the government hampered uh, the labor market and imposed a maximum work time on each worker. Right. So the consequence was then unemployment, and it was uh, misery in Austria. And because all of this was financed out of the printing press, well, it also meant increasingly uh, rising prices, and this rise in prices was only hampered by the regime of price controls that was still in place, so it showed only for a while in the declining exchange rate of the Austrian currency of the krone. And we know what a regime of uh, inflation ultimately must lead to, well, because the money loses its purchasing power more and more, well, finally people will uh, start abandoning this currency, so it leads to social disintegration. Uh, people will no longer obey the commands of the, uh, of the government, they will go their own way. And this is also what the Austrian provinces in 1919 did. They, at some point, they just start ob uh, stopped obeying <laughs> the orders of the central government, and then they applied their own homegrown socialistic schemes. Okay? Because they were uh, very much inspired by the rhetoric, the eat the, the eat the rich rhetoric of the Vienna socialists, who ruled the country, but they say, okay, well, uh, but the way you redistribute your, the resources, that, that's not to our liking, so, so we eat the rich our way. We want to eat the rich, you shouldn't eat them. So the country was very much, very quickly going to complete disintegration. How to repair the situation? What to do in such a case? Well, Mises uh, offered uh, a solution that will not surprise us today because we are already acquainted with this work. He said, well, the government needs to get out of the picture. Uh, it's the government who has created the situation. It's the government who has created class conflict between uh, uh, dominant and, and, and politically inferior groups. Uh, it is the government that has in created, uh, started the war, that has continued the war, and that has then uh, extended the war onto the domestic economy. It, the it was the government who has um, uh, resorted to inflation to finance all of this. 
So we need to reduce the activity of government as far as possible. What does this mean as far as possible? Now here Mises gives no uh, absolute limit. That's a very intriguing aspect. And in this 1919 book it says, well, uh, as far as possible, and there are some technological constraints. For example, if you want to have a uh, developed legal uh, judicial system with courts of appeal and so on, uh, this might not be uh, financially possible for very small territories. Uh, so in such cases, you might need to bound up, tie up with, with, uh, with other territories. You cannot decrease the size of government further. But that was the only consideration at all that he gave. So by and large, uh, his recommendation was in, was in line with what Murray Rothbard later called anarcho-capitalism. Okay? Reduce the size of government if necessary or if wished to zero. Okay, so this was in his, his analysis and his recommendation. What else, well, apart from publishing this book, what else did he do? What was his action in 1919? Well, uh, we can highlight three different activities. First of all, he taught a seminar uh, at the university, and he created a private seminar apart from the group that he taught at the university. Uh, so the, we have the origin of his uh, later famous private seminar in late 1919. It started it in, in November 1919. Second, so apart from the general pedagogical effort, uh, forming a, a new intellectual elite, he also uh, was not too, uh, felt not too good to engage in direct one-to-one, one-on-one persuasion. And the most important case uh, concerned his uh, persuading Otto Bauer, the leader of the uh, socialists in, uh, in Vienna, of the Austro-Marxists, as they call themselves, uh, not to introduce a communist regime in Austria. Okay, so when the socialists came to power, uh, especially the young radicals, wanted to go the full way. Uh, why stop halfway? Socialism, socialism is the most effective system. Communism is wonderful, so let's do it right now. And um, then Mises explained to Bauer what the in inevitable consequences would be. Vienna at the time, precisely because um, uh, Austria did not have uh, the farming necessary to... Uh, to feed the population was dependent on foreign imports. It had uh, foodstuff available for nine days maximum. Uh, so any uh, uh, period beyond nine days would have to be financed by foreign food imports. Who would be ready to give them credits for this? Which foreign government uh, would give a credit to a communist regime in Austria? not the neighbors around it, who before had, had furnished the, the foodstuff, not the Hungarians, uh, not the Czechs, uh, because precisely they hated, <laughs> they hated the Germans. Okay? And the Western powers wouldn't give any credits either. They had no interest whatever in, in financing uh, communism. So the system, all that the system would have created was a, 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 an economic and political collapse in record time, and as a consequence, complete social disintegration, bands roaming the streets of, of Vienna, violence, uh, and anarchy. And Bauer gave in. So Bauer heeded the voice of reason, and uh, well, later he resented this very much. He could never forgive Mises that he had turned him before the radicals of his party into a moderate. Okay, he wanted to <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to be a radical, and uh, yeah, well, uh, yeah. he couldn't forgive Mises for this. And then third, Mises did something quite extraordinary in um, uh, preparing. Uh, monetary reform in Austria. For he had uh, two different plans. One was the official plan that he advocated in uh, two widely noticed publications of, uh, at the time, in which he called for monetary union between Austria and Germany. And the second plan, and that is the fantastic thing, was uh, expressed in a private, in a confidential memorandum, in, uh, which was addressed to the industrialists and, and bankers of Austria and calling them to prepare um, a monetary reform uh, which left the government completely out of the picture. So, <laughs> so what he said, forget about these guys. Uh, they are completely incapable of reforming anything. They cannot even keep, uh, reform themselves. Um, so you need to do the job. Right? And you need to prepare for the emergency situation that will come if the government continues in its present policies. And he detailed then the steps that the these, these people would have to take uh, 
take a credit from abroad, prepare uh, a system of payments uh, for the case of emergency. And, well, I would say that in, in all of these three actions, uh, Mises is uh, uh, very much inspiring. Right? It's exactly what we, what we should do in our day as well. Fortunately, we are not yet in 1919, but we will get, get there one, way, one day in our, to our 1919 if we persist in our present policies and our present orientation. Right? And the only way to stem this tide is, well, sound analysis. That's what we are here doing. Uh, teaching, that's again what we are doing at the Mises Institute. One-on-one -on -one, uh, persuasion, if necessary. So if Paul Krugman wants to repent and show up, <laughs> we'll, we'll take him here. And uh, yeah, various others as well. well yeah. So we, we are charitable. We would even take uh, Mr. Bush. Uh, and, then, and then third also, we should always try to think outside of the box. And that's also what we are trying to do here at the Mises in Institute. Think outside of the box and uh, think uh, unorthodoxly, preparing, if necessary, reform of the country without the government. Thank you very much.